And welcome to Real Ag Live, everybody. There we are. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, Sean Haney, your host here today on Real Ag Live. Thanks a lot for uh, making Real Ag Live a part of your day. And, uh, of course, everybody, check out Real, uh, Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio 147 every day at 4.30 Eastern on Sirius XM. Today, uh, we brought Peter Wee-Pete Johnson back. We're going to have a lot of fun here today discussing all the agronomic issues from across the country. If you do have a question for Pete, what I encourage you to do is to ask it. Like, get involved. Come into the conversation. All you got to do is enter your question into the social media platform that you're watching on, whether that's Twitter, Periscope, YouTube, or Facebook. So I'd uh, love to get as many questions from across Canada, the U.S., or maybe even Europe. We had one from Greece one time. That was pretty cool. Okay, <laughs> uh, I'll bring him in here. It is uh, Peter Wee, Pete Johnson. Hey, Pete, how are you? I'm awesome. Thanks for asking, Shane. Sean. We, we have some rain here in Ontario today. Uh, not everywhere, but some of the driest areas down South Lambton, uh, you know, they've been crying for a rain. An inch and one-tenth out of today's rainfall for some of those producers at least. So uh, I, I know there's a lot of people still crying for rain, particularly up in the Grey Bruce Peninsula, but some rainfall and, and we badly needed it, that's for sure, man. Yeah, you know, I was talking to somebody this morning on the prairies here, and they said, you know, for the outside of the Peace and maybe southeastern Saskatchewan, things are looking pretty good out this way too. Awesome. That's the way uh, you just want things to work, right? Like it's You take such risk, and, and you try to do everything right, and you invest all this money, and and Mother Nature, if she, if, right, um, the, the quote is, Mother Nature is not always that motherly. And so when when she decides to, to trump all your good work, it, it's pretty frustrating. But, man, nothing nicer than looking out at a good field right now, a good crop. That It just, yeah, walking good wheat fields this time of year, just, there's nothing better in my opinion. Well, and we're kind of past that part of the year. Like, you know, initially an emergence, if things didn't come up super even, it looks pretty ugly. Sometimes in a zero till situation, it, it looks a little ragged off the hop trying to get above that stubble. But now we're at the point of the year where it looks lush and it looks green in the spring wheat for sure here on the prairies. Uh, canola as well. Things are looking good. It's, I like this time of the year. Yeah, so, and, and you're 100% right, although in the corn crop, right? So so with corn, it changed its root system. And so just because you can to see this, and, and for the growers that got rain, the rain, like, it's way easier for a root to push through wet soil than it is dry soil. Dry soil is like cement. It can't push through. If it's got some moisture there, the moisture is a lubricant, and plus it needs the moisture. But what... About the five leaf stage of corn, it changes from that seminal root system to its secondary root system. And that's what it survives on the rest of the year, the nodal roots, if you will. And when it's doing that, if it's dry and you plant it a bit tough, oh my gosh, things just go all south. And we were seeing quite a bit of that here in Ontario, you know, because there were fields that maybe weren't quite as dry as we thought at planting time. So nice to get some rain and, and yeah, some of the corn really going, going strong as we chatted about yesterday, that gross syndrome where she's yeah. just going too fast, but, but no, it, uh, it's interesting. That's for sure. Well, Hey, w like one of the rules is knee high corn by the 1st of July. We're the, yep. we're the 23rd man. We're, we talked about this yesterday on Real Ag Radio. We're breaking all the rules. Forget yeah, about absolutely. them. We got knee yeah, high corn already. We yeah, knee high corn. And if you if you happen to catch that inch of rain today, uh, we are on track for you know 250 bushel corn per acre, baby. A good looking corn and and knee high by the 15th of June in many cases. That's that's well ahead of schedule, uh, especially. Yeah, as we talked, it just, it was so cold all of the spring. Uh, we planted cold, the corn struggled to emerge. Everybody was kind of like, oh, pr pretty, not feeling very comfortable. And yet now, uh, man, things are good. Father's Day comes along and you've got knee-high corn. It's it's all good. You're rubbing off on me. I'm waving my arms and I'm talking. I'm... <laughs> Sorry, man. It's just, I, I am I am that way. I talk with my hands. I, I'll try not to do that on a Skype call. But yeah. <laughs> Knock your coffee over. It's all over your computer. Hey, yeah. uh, Pete, I got a question here from Lara. 
She says, hey, Pete, I've been reviewing an application videos on real ag for protein development in wheat. I know it's 10 days after uh, anthesis for a dribble band app, but would you recommend, say, five to seven days for a surface broadcast, depending on rain forecasted? Okay, so we're talking dry fertilizer now, I assume, Sean, that because uh, if we're if we're surface application, don't the only way to actually get it to the surface would be a dry product like amidus or or urea, something like that. And in that case, absolutely, I think you could even go right at anthesis unless the pro the product. So this is really interesting. Right now in Ontario, we have some growers who are side dressing corn over the top with either ammonium nitrate or urea or a blend of urea, ammonium sulfate or amidus. And a grower actually sent me pictures this morning. He put ammonium nitrate on last Friday in the afternoon the crop was dry and already today he's seeing the new leaves emerge and the edges of that new leaf are all fried from uh, ammonia burn so the dust it's just in strips right behind the spreader the dust in that product in the whirl and didn't spread and so he's getting th these damage strips th through the field so for a dirt product uh, make sure if you put it on, I, like I would like a product with as little dust or fines as possible and a fairly uniform prill because we need to get a uniform spread pattern. And if we, if we don't have uniform prill size, for example, you take urea, you blend it with ammonium sulfate, their density is different. And so you try to spread that, they don't spread the same. And so we don't get uniform application. This is actually where a product like Amidus really, really works well because it's both nitrogen and sulfur in one granule. But for protein, you probably already have enough sulfur, a dry product to go out there and spread dry urea or something like that. I don't think you have to wait necessarily for 10 days after anthesis. With the dribble banding, we're, we have to wait for 10 days because there's times when that dribble band of urea or 28%, typically we like to use urea, but it can burn. Yeah. Even though we're doing everything to prevent it, it can burn. If it burns at anthesis, you, you destroy pollination, you lose yield. So yeah, I would say, Lara, you, five to seven days if and and you need the rain to put it in into the ground so if you have rain forecast get out there and do it 100 percent. yeah and we've been getting the rain on the prairies here like that that this year that has not been the problem for the most part awesome no that's cool so you guys should have massive spring wheat yield sean you should be like 100 bushel plus no question we're hoping fingers yeah, crossed yeah if she's not in the <laughs> Yeah, so actually, we we're having a, a conversation about wheat and how it was suffering in the drought and the heat. And by the way, we had some days here and, and wheat doesn't like 30 degree days. And somebody was, uh, co you know, not complaining, but, but disappointed because they expected record wheat yields and that was kind of shrinking away. And uh, Larry Cowan tweeted out, uh, you know, never count your wheat bushels until they're in the bin. Yes. And I would say, uh, but I, I would actually say, don't count your corn bushels, your soybean bushels, your canola bushels, your lentil. Don't count any of them. Any bushels. The yeah, don't count exactly. any bushels. <laughs> right. But, when they're in the bin, you got them. But we established yesterday on Real Ag Radio, happy corn, happy farmer. Uh, we, so we've established that, which goes kind of thing for every crop as well. Yeah, absolutely. In, in Western Canada, it should, in, you guys should be, you know, happy spring wheat crop happy farmer but more likely than that it's some stupid saying like happy canola crop happy farmer <laughs> yeah well or you know it's pollinator week so it's happy bees happy farmer maybe it's it's like, yeah uh, ab absolutely yeah happy bees and and then the canola's pollinating well everybody's happy yeah i, I gotta bees, get some well. of those t-shirts made i think is what we need to do yeah yeah that's cool very cool uh, Kara makes a comment here and says, considering wheat was headed out by the beginning of June last year, we're sailing this year, which is a great comment because you think back to actually right about this time last year in the prairies, we were so dry. People weren't going to apply a herbicide. We were writing the crop off. And then the last two weeks of June into, well, actually last week of June, first week of July, boom, the rains came. And then all of a sudden we had a crop again. So you, you know, we always compare La uh, in Ontario to last year because of how horrific the spring was. But in the West, it was the exact opposite. It was so dry, 
this year has just been way better in both parts of the country for the most part. Hey, come on. We had we had two very tough years. 18 was a tough year. 19 was a tough year weather-wise, right? So it's time we had a good year, Sean. We're going to have a good year. So touch wood, right? Touch wood. She's going to carry on right through. Absolutely. Okay, uh, what do we want to hit on here? Do you want to talk a little bit more about nitrogen? That was one of the things we wanted to chat about, and Lara asked a lead-off question on nitrogen, yeah, so we kind of moved yeah, on. Yeah, no. So no, absolutely. So so what what I find really interesting is is kind of how this whole nitrogen thing is playing out, and we're we're pretty much most of the side dress is done, most of the nitrogen decisions are made, but the Y drops. So people now have opportunity to apply nitrogen much later in the corn crop than they used to, and it doesn't matter whether it's wheat or it's corn or it's canola, any crop, the later you can you can wait to make that nitrogen decision, the better decision you can make because you know how much rainfall you've had in Western Canada. You know what your stand looks like in, in here in Eastern Canada, how, how uniform it is. And, and by the way, in the corn crop, as we've talked, uniformity is a big, big deal. So what's really interesting is that that the nitrogen results have been coming back, that there's actually more nitrogen than normal in the soil. So you kind of say, how can that actually work? Because we had a cold spring, so there should be less nitrogen because we should get the nitrogen from the bi biological release in the soil. But no, there's, there's more nitrogen. Well, well, why is that? It's because we were dry. And when we're dry, we don't denitrify things. And so what we're seeing is is more nitrogen than normal. So I have a, I have soybean fields where we've applied 100 pounds of nitrogen to the corn crop. We have 200 bushel yield potential, and my soil nitrates are so high that I should apply no more nitrogen. I should be able to grow 200 bushel corn off that 100 pounds of nitrogen. And I, as an agronomist, making recommendations to that grower. That's a really tough recommendation to make because we would normally say at least 160 pounds of nitrogen there. So this is 60 pounds less nitrogen than normal. Meanwhile, in my other fields, same grower, we have wheat after, or pardon me, corn after wheat, which is really the rotation we should have. Corn should go after wheat, and it's wheat with a cover crop. And not only that, they applied manure to the cover crop last fall. So we have wheat. We have lots of manure applied, and we have a cover crop into that into that wheat stubble that we planted corn into. Now, which should need more nitrogen, Sean? The wheat, or pardon me, the corn into my soybean residue? I know I shouldn't ask you questions. I know that's against the rules, well, the, but I'm you're, going You're to. trying to embarrass the host again. That's what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I like to embarrass you. It's all good. So my corn after soybeans or my corn after that man, wheat, meat, manure, and cover crop. Which should need more nitrogen? Corn after soybeans. Exactly. Yes, you're right. <laughs> what do I win? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What what you win is the is the head scratcher because when you look at the soil nitrates, my wheat or pardon me, my corn after wheat with cover crop and manure yeah. needs a lot more nitrogen than my corn after soybeans. And it, how can that be? But what's going on, we're pretty sure, is that that big cover crop, we, we had cover crop in there and it was a multi-species blend, but lots of oats. She was nearly up to my armpit. That's how tall it grew. And it tied up all that nitrogen and it's not releasing it. So it's exact opposite of, of what you would recommend in May. In May, you would have said, put more nitrogen on that uh, corn following soybean stubble. But if we can wait and... You know, you know, either side dress or Y drop. We can get that added information. We can look at the soil nitrate test, and we've totally flipped. We're going to put more nitrogen on that that corn that's following wheat than we are on that corn that's following soybeans. Really bizarre. Uh, what else should we talk about here? Uh, what about uh, you know what? Actually, I've been reading, and well, actually, we talked about a little bit on the radio show yesterday too, but. Army worms, and it make, makes me think back to early days of real ag. You are the army worms were like taken over in Ontario, and I think it was like 2000. You're gonna correct, you're gonna know the year 2010, 11, eight. Two, was it 2008? Yep, that wow, 
Like it was really early days of re- that was the first year of real agriculture, and we did a video, we, or we did an audio interview about the army worms and how they were taken over. And uh, I remember that video got tons and tons of views, and we're back to that again this year. Uh, what, yep. Let's talk about the thresholds. Yeah. So this is this is again where I think it, it's it's people want to make one recommendation or have one number. And, and it simply doesn't work. So we've been counting army worms, finding army worms. We talked yesterday, like the Niagara Peninsula, it's harsh down there. It's hardcore harsh down there. So no flag leaves left. It's super dry. Uh, the army worms, between the army worms and the, and the dr- dry weather, it's kind of like, oh my gosh, that beautiful wheat crop has just been decimated. But we always talk about this five army worm per square foot or four to five army worm per square foot. That's the threshold. The problem is if I have two army worm right at, at heading versus I have six army worm 25 days later, so I'm now 25 days into grain fill, which is going to cause me more problems? And the answer is probably the two right at heading because they're going to feed and eat a whole bunch of flag leaf that I need to make that photosynthate to fill the wheat kernel. If I have six army worm or even 10 army worm 25 days later, well, I only get, in in a perfect world, I get a 35-day grain fill. This year, we've had really hot temperatures, so we had a bunch of days at 30 plus Celsius. You get 30 plus Celsius. Well, if we get 32 days of grain fill, we're going to be pretty fortunate this year. So I don't care how many army worm I have on day 25, they can eat all the flag leaf off and, and it's not going to make much difference. And so as growers look at that threshold and are trying to make the decision, and what's really interesting, Sean, is that the army worm are progressing north. So we, we had them in the Niagara Peninsula, we had them in Chatham-Kent, then they were in South Lambton. Uh, now they're at Stratford. They've moved up into Gray and Bruce counties, so up into the more northern climate. So it almost like they're moving with the maturity of the wheat crop. And I get tons of questions about should I spray, shouldn't I spray? And the threshold is good, but I think we have to look at the threshold and then look how far we are into grain fill and put those two numbers together to decide whether or not we need to control them. Last night, I showed my kids. The, the whole alligator thing. The, yeah, cool. Very did, cool. Did I tell yes. you about that with the ladybugs? No. Yeah, go on. I, you didn't tell me about it. Oh, well, you were educating me yesterday about how ladybug larvae, they look like alligators. And so I looked yeah. it up and pulled up some images on Google last night. I was showing my kids who don't know much about this kind of stuff. And uh, we had a really cool discussion about it. You're right. They do look like little alligators. Yeah, little alligators. And and so, and I wasn't 100% sure, and I asked Tracy Bowdy, the entomologist here in Ontario, because in some of these fields, I'm finding very few army worm, and I'm finding, well, I, you know, kind of alligator alert, because there's all, like, there's just, there's an alligator, like, man, I, they were crawling on me. There was so many in the field that, that they were moving off the plants and onto my legs. That's pretty rare. But Tracy said that they will feed on armyworm eggs and maybe even on the really small armyworm larva. Oh, because I was going to ask you this question because ladybugs are traditionally beneficial for aphids. Is there a beneficial for armyworms? That's interesting. Yeah, so they they would never feed on a big army worm because the big army worm, well, you'd take you'd take a thousand little alligators to, <laughs> yeah, to tackle yeah. a big army worm. But but the 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 eggs and the real little ones and maybe in that particular field because it's a gorgeous field and why why there were so many ladybugs there I don't know but uh, or ladybug larvae uh, but it was very cool very very cool hey, I love it. Hey Pete, we we talked about the the wheat crop uh, looking pretty good out here out, out west. There's going to be a lot of growers thinking about fungicide application. Okay, let's go through yep. the the what to do and what not to do in terms of fungicide application in spring wheat. Yeah, so first off, you, you always have to tie fungicide applications to the disease level in the crop. 
So you got to know what diseases are out there. And, you know, we had that grower that, that, uh, sent me the email about his spring wheat in Montana and how you know, that wheat didn't have any disease. And it was uh, it looked like it was just about kind of grow stage 30, grow stage 31. So the first node stage kind of getting into that that time frame. Well, so you can go and spray a fungicide at that time frame. If you have no disease, it's kind of like, yeah, I don't know, we can get some benefit, but it's not huge. The later you can delay a fungicide application, and it doesn't matter uh, if I look at Kelly Turkington's data, I look at Sherry Stride Horse's data, so they're both Western Canadian uh, pathologists, right, doing, doing work, or I look at the Ontario data, the later I can push my fungicide application towards heading, the more yield boost I get. And that's oh. because, right, so it's because... The, the big yield gain is when you have green leaves through grain fill. When I can photosynthesize through grain fill and just power that, that sugars into the kernel and make big kernels and lots of them, I get more yield gain. So in a perfect world, you know, we, we spray at flag leaf or boot stage or heading. And if you've got a fusarium risk, I've got a couple of emails from Western Canada, guys worrying about fusarium in the wheat crop, then then you have to spray a fusarium fungicide. I'm, I'm just, man, too many times we get caught on that one. So I really think that's important. The challenge in Western Canada is if you wait for that fusarium fungicide and you get heavy disease pressure on the flag leaf, before you get to that fusarium timing, you can lose way too much leaf tissue. So you really got to scout that disease and push that fungicide application as late as you can and try to get maximum yield gain out of it. And if you can wait till fusarium timing, perfect. So if you see the d disease developing, spray. If you have a healthy yeah. looking crop, push that spray window back as far as you can, as close to heading as possible, to maximize yield. Yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah. then we can talk about two fungicide programs if you, if you want. I mean, certainly sometimes you spray, if you get stripe rust early, right? If you have stripe rust, if the guy in Montana with that, you know, the wheat that was six inches tall, if he had stripe rust and he might, well, you got to spray stripe rust right away. You yeah. can't fool around. Yeah. And, and then you probably get yield benefit from a second fungicide application kind of into that head heading time frame or somewhere in that range. But with a single application, yeah, absolutely. You push it back as far as you can. You got it. You're, I'm going, I'm going to train you as an agronomist yet, Sean. Hey, I got, if you'll call me an agronomist, it's right up there with JP Gervais saying I was an, an economist. So <laughs> man, you are multi-talented, man. It depends like, what day of the week it is. Golf, you, you can play baseball. You can, you're an economist. You're an agronomist. You, oh. You're a radio host. <laughs> oh, there's a lot, there's a lot of knowledge up there, Pete. The trouble is it's like a football field, except it's only like an inch deep. It's not, <laughs> there's a lot of talk. Yeah, yeah. Maybe my mom says I'm just a good BS or maybe is what, is what it is. Uh, hey, I got another question from Kara. This is a, this is a good one. Uh, what are the drawbacks of applying fungicides at the same time as your PGR, your plant growth regulator? Oh, so, so there's real, the, the drawback is that for the, for the PGR to really work the best, I want to apply it fairly early in the going. So depends on the growth regulator, but kind of growth stage 30 to 32. So, so let's say first to second node, that's the sweet spot. And remember what I said about like, when should you apply that, that fungicide, Sean? You said it already. When yeah. should I apply that fungicide? Well, as, as close, late as, as, as close to the heading as possible. Right, exactly. So if, if I put it with the PGR and I'm putting the PGR on at first node, a long way away from heading. Yeah. And so I'm not getting the maximum benefit. If you're in a two fungicide program, then that might work. But typically, most of the time, I want my growth regulator on before it's it's the maximum benefit out of the fungicide. So if you put the two together, it's generally a compromise and either you don't get as much impact from the plant growth regulator as you would like, or you get not as much benefit out of the fungicide as you would like. I got one for you. Also, 
do not do the old practice in the in the early days of tilt where when when we're applying our herbicide we put a half rate of tilt in don't do that because we're building up fungicide resistance exactly yeah <laughs> and yeah so so i'm i'm i just hate half rate fungicides man so half rate fungicide costs you 4 bucks an acre full rate costs you 8 and you'd get no residual. It makes no sense whatsoever. If you're going to drive through the field and the trip through the field costs you more than the fungicide you're applying, put on more fungicide. It just doesn't make sense. Lindsay just sent me a note and says, half rate of tilt. Those were the days. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but also, yeah, those were not the days. But it also shows, Pete, that we learn, right? Like, yeah. We, we learned right. that, that was a and, practice and, that a lot of people did. We thought we thought there was a benefit there. There probably was some trialing to show that there was a ben- some sort of a benefit. But hey, we, we learn. Yeah, no, a hundred percent, and and that's where the the answer can change with additional science, and that's the way it should be. So yes, so yes, we've learned half rates. Number one, the benefit was small. We did it for convenience. It's just like. Why the PGR with the fungicide? Well, back then, we were throwing half-rate fungicide in with the herbicide just because it was convenient. Yeah. And you figured you didn't need much yield gain because the half-rate herbicide – or fungicide, rather, the trip through the field is zero because I'm going through the field with, with my herbicide anyway. anyway. So throw it in for insurance, and if I get half a bushel out of it, it's okay. Meanwhile, it does – build up more resistance. Uh, Like there's just lots of things wrong with that strategy, but we learned a hundred percent. We're, we were going to talk about tillage and soybeans. Uh, I did play a clip yesterday with horse Bonner uh, talking about some pre-till work that they've been doing and looking at comparing it to, uh, to no till. What are some of your thoughts on tillage and soybeans? Yeah. So not just tillage and soybeans, but tillage in general. So, so, I, it's been a great year. <laughs> Disclaimer, has... here comes a rant. Here comes a rant. <laughs> I, Sean, that, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm hurt. Do I ever go on a rant? I never rant, do I? <laughs> uh, no. no. So it's, <laughs> totally out of character. I, yeah, right, exactly. No, it's been, it's been so cool. So first off, Horst, Horst is pretty much a tillage guy on soybeans. And I'm sure that clip you played yesterday, he he's saying don't know till the soybeans because it's just too hard to get a good stand. Meanwhile, all of his data would say that the no-till soybeans yield just as much as the tilled soybeans or certainly within a bushel or two. So it's never an economic benefit to till those soybeans, but the stand is just easier to establish. It comes out of the ground faster. It looks better. And and so just from a peace of mind standpoint, as much as anything, Horst is, is saying, yep, just do that little bit of pre-tillage for the, all it costs. It's worth it from an insurance standpoint. But this whole tillage thing, like, man, it is so interesting. So I had a great chat with with one of my local pioneer dealer, another agronomist, Russ Barker, before you and I got on, Sean. And, and we're talking about, about strip till. And we're actually just tillage in general. And so much we don't understand about tillage. So I tweeted out headland compaction on Saturday. And, and that has got such a great discussion going. But I all of that. this... Yeah, like, uh, man, our headlands are so beat up with no stand, and I don't know, part of it might be that just these high-speed discs, and, and you turn on the end, and, and all that weight goes on the wheels at the back, and, and like, I, there's a whole bunch going on there. But from a tillage standpoint, we, like, why did it go so hard this spring? We planted corn, we thought it was good conditions, and it ended up going hard without rain. Uh, has an excellent example where they went in, they strip tilled in the spring. It was dry. It looked beautiful. They planted the corn. It came up great. But when they were looking at it, they, they thought, wow, you know, this strip tiller is really loosening that ground up more than we would like. And, and a day later, they thought maybe we should roll it. Uh, they didn't get out there with a roller. They just had a lighter packer. And now in that field, what they're finding is really good areas. The headland, by the way, is perfect. Why is the headland perfect? Because they tracked over it as they were doing everything and they compressed that so that it wasn't too loose. 
but areas of the field where now the corn is not growing well and it's because the soil is too loose. They didn't get it compacted down after they went through the strip tiller well enough. And so there's just so much we need to learn about tillage. It's amazing, right? It's just amazing because we've been doing it. I don't know, the plow was invented in what, 1797 or something like that? The first plow, Jethro Tull? And we still haven't got tillage figured out. It's just is <laughs> bizarre, man. It is just bizarre. But yeah, I, I it's it's a it's a work in progress. Tillage to to me after how many years in this business, tillage is a work in progress. Why but why is that? Like I wish I understood. There so Russ's comment is that I need every, every tillage piece known to man sitting in my shed and every year and you know every three days through that year i'm going to be using a different piece of tillage equipment they just there's no one system even the moldboard plow and spring cult fall moldboard and spring cultivation can still absolutely fail and so we just it's too variable and and it's is it's a, a, an art as much as it is a science the really good farmers they're artists as as well as scientists. So, is is your tillage equipment sort of like your golf bag, where you have a different club for every sort of situation? Is is that what your tillage your tillage implements are like? Uh, I actually don't mind that analogy, Sean. That that's pretty pretty good for for golfers. That that sort of works. Except maybe we don't we don't need uh, uh, you know nine irons and and. Uh, uh, well, actually, I guess it would be maybe we don't just need six irons and three woods in the golf bag. Maybe we need, I don't know, 25 irons and 14 woods in the golf bag to actually do it all. But and it responds differently every year as well. Right. So it's not just uh, it's not just the tillage tool, but it's also how the it's going to interact with the weather that we get from that from that point on. It, it, it's a whole bunch of fun and a whole bunch of of uh, scratch your head. Uh, Ken Kura, who's watching on Facebook, he his comment about all this is bigger iron plus more yield, therefore more snow, stover to deal with. Yeah, and and so from a no-till standpoint, Ken's a hundred percent right. If he's referring back to our d discussion with horse tillage and, and the no-till, so I cut my teeth on no-till back in in believe it or not, 1985. Now I shouldn't tell you that, Sean, because it tells you just how old I'm getting to be. But uh, you know, in 1985, if I had any crop, I thought I'd really done something, and I can still remember the year that we we broke a hundred bushel per acre corn crop is like home. Oh my gosh, we thought we died and gone to heaven. Yeah. Now, if my corn isn't over 200 bushel per acre, I'm uh, uh, I, can, I cannot go to the coffee shop because I'll get laughed out of the place. And we have growers that are growing 240, 250, 260. So if you think about the amount of residue that you put in the soil and how your tillage equipment has to fight with that in order to get the seed in the soil and all that that kind of thing. Ken's 100% right. In in the late 80s, early 90s, no-till was a different a different beast than it is today in 2020. Well, and I'll say, you know, out here, I'm in the Palliser Triangle, like any tillage is considered bad tillage. Like p people do whatever possible to never disturb that soil because they don't want to go back to the 1930s and 40s yeah no the erosion the dust bowl for sure plus every time you till the soil you lose moisture so you're in the palace or triangle man you can't afford to lose any moisture so so all i can say though sean is don't don't most of your guys still use those things called hoe drills <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> yes they do pete <laughs> Yes, okay, so, so so they do tillage. Those stinking hole drills, oh, man, they do a lot. Oh, I see. Uh, it's, it, okay, it's <laughs> it's one pass tillage. It's like an all in one system, Pete. Yeah, it is that. I give you that. Absolutely, I give you that. But it's still like, man, they do quite a bit of tillage when in that seeding pass. Absolutely. Well, you know what? I because we've written some stories about how you know if we lose some of these products like glyphosate or some of these herbicides it's going to force people to go back to their weed removal program could be some sort of tillage. 
and like it it just gets the hair on the back of some people's neck to stand up and they just go crazy that we would go back to that sort of uh, system or have to, or have to rely on it yeah well and and I'm totally on that I, I'm a no-till guy or or as as little tillage as possible and and that is because we know the benefits of residue we know the benefits not only in, in terms of wind erosion but but in terms of soil health and water aggregate stability and infiltration mm-hmm. the less i can do the better off the healthier my soil is the better the so- the water will infiltrate and all those things that we need it to happen. By the way, that that headland that I tweeted out with the compaction, uh, there ain't much water infiltration going on there, Sean. Like there's just she's just like cement. Really? It's like just concrete. It's like a, it's like it uh, in a silage field, right? Every you know the trucks that are driving through on the same end of the field. It, it gets to be. It is like concrete by the end of the the, the time the field's finished. Yep, absolutely. And and so in this situation, and, and I don't know all the details there, but that the picture I tweeted out is just was just a good example. I'm seeing it all over the place. Not always that severe, but in some cases just just as severe. And and yeah, you, you we just are beating up the headlands. And and to Ken's Ken's point, if I'm pulling 240 bushel corn off of that cornfield, that's a, that's a ton of trips out with the grain buggy, right? The or oh, or yeah. trucks or wagons or or whatever. So one of, a lot of growers now they're putting they're putting gravel laneways or or loading stations into the field in the middle of the so field. So that not in no on the edge, okay. right? But at least so that that the truck never enters the field. They keep the truck out of the field, and and that grain buggy is coming up onto that to load, so that they're they're tracking as little as they can on that headland uh, to to get things loaded and moved out of the field. Kara brings up a good point, and she's in Bow Island. If we tilled here, we'd be back to the Dust Bowl. So hey, yeah. Pete, hey Pete, what kind of moorboard plow do you own? <laughs> What, what's your brand? What's your brand? So I I have I have a a one furrow moldboard plow that was given to me when I at at twenty five years with Middlesex Soil and Crop they they presented me with this you know uh, thanks for twenty five years of service kind of as a memorial to to. To me, or not, but a, a memorial a trophy. <laughs> no, no, sorry, not memorial. I, I used the wrong word there. As a trophy, or, or as a as a reward. That yes. was it. As a reward for for putting up with them for 25 years, they gave me a one for a moldboard plow on a stand. I might add, Sean, and there it still sits. That is awesome. <laughs> yep. <laughs> if 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 yeah. you want to get Pete fired up, just talk about tillage and hoe drills. That's the. I, <laughs> Everybody has a button, <laughs> and that's Pete's. It's like just. <laughs> oh yeah, I I have some other buttons, Sean, but I ain't telling you what those are, baby. Uh, hey, I yeah, I got another. I got a question here from Brett. He says, "How reliable are PSN tests?" Yeah, so that's the pre-sidrate nitrate test in corn. Okay, and and so there. The, the, they're as reliable. They're, they're a snapshot in time, and so that's one of the things you got to be really careful with is that you take them at the right time. So a PSNT is designed to be taken basically at at six to eight leaf corn, and what's really interesting is if you go out and and you start taking nitrate tests on on waist high corn, uh, the the numbers just drop off to zero. Uh, as that corn gets taller and taller, and you kind of say, wow, there's no nitrogen there. But there's actually all sorts of nitrogen there. It's just that the corn crop is sucking it up so fast that that it's pulling it out of the soil quicker than it can become re- released. And so you you can't use those nitrate tests to predict very much. So so the timing, timing of that nitrate test is really quite important. And the reality is that in the data set, uh, it only explains about 30% of the variability. So what that says is that three times out of 10, it will predict the actual right rate. Now, I, you, got, you, got, you kind of say, well, then why would I even use it? Well, so the, one of the smartest guys I ever knew on nitrogen uh, on corn research, uh, a guy by the name of Steve Hawkins out of a, a university, Purdue University in Indiana, and he came up and, and gave us a presentation, and he said that doing research on nitrogen 
is like counting a stampede of wild horses after dark. <laughs> it's like trying to... So it's just it's it's like thirty percent doesn't doesn't seem like much, but it actually really if we if we have sort of a base understanding, we can take that and we can use that to fine tune our nitrogen and actually get pretty darn close so there's some other things coming on like rainfall in that june 15th to july 15th time frame that also play there's other tools out there the the nitrate test is simply one of the tools that that helps us fine tune that nitrogen recommendation so do i have to do multiple psn tests then and average them out because the test is somewhat unreliable or no no, so so what you what you absolutely need to do is you need to figure out uh, or not figure out, but you need to do enough tests that you get a, a good representation of the field. Because if you pull one nitrate test, whatever that number that number is is accurate for where you took the test. It's a snapshot in time of that spot. And so if you go and all you test is the high low low area of the field, the high organic matter area of the field, well, the eroded knoll might be a different number, and so you you need to do enough testing to make sure that 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 number is solid for the field, or or make your your nitrogen prescription map where you know that there's you know this is the end test in the hollow, this is the end test on the hill, and you make that nitrogen prescription map. So I think you can do it both ways, mm. but. You, you got you to gotta make sure that you get a representative sample for what you're going to apply the nitrogen on. That's the key. Interesting. That's, that's cool stuff. Uh, okay. Hey, Pete, you know what? We've been talking for almost 45 minutes. Like, can you believe that, that actually went really fast? <laughs> well, I, I can believe that you've been talking for 45 minutes, but me, Sean, I, I couldn't talk that long to save my soul. Oh, no, he's never got anything to say. You got to <laughs> poke him to get him to say anything. <laughs> Hey, uh, Pete, if, every week Pete puts out a podcast called Wheat Pete's Word. He does a tremendous job on it. It goes back to his time uh, with Omafra as the wheat specialist. He's continued on with Wheat Pete's Word. Uh, Pete, if somebody ha wants to ask you any questions for that podcast, how do they do that? So any way at all, they can tweet me the question or direct message me on Twitter the question. They can email me the question, just P Johnson, J O H N S O N at realagriculture.com. They can text me that that message. My my phone number's on my Twitter uh, page at Wheat Pete. So you can get all that information there. My email address as well if you go to my home page there. Uh, lots of different ways. I don't care how you get it to me. Leave it in the voicemail system. Call Wheat Pete's Word. There's a voicemail system attached there. And you can just leave it by voice there. You you get it to me. We're going to talk about it if we can at all. And and by the way, really love that system, right? Because it's the feedback that makes it so interesting. And and yeah, it's cool when I get questions from Greece or South Africa or or I don't know Montana or Alberta. It just adds to the fun. It just adds to the fun. Absolutely. Like I, I've always said that with you know, in our with the whole time with real agriculture is that we learn so much from each other in different regions. We can get so locked into how the way that we do it in our in our area, our province, our county, our area of Canada, and we can you can't implement everything from other areas, but if you just pick up a little bit, just learn a little bit, that that's where we really move forward. Yeah, hundred percent. And and if all you do is is look at what you do the same thing as what you did last year, you'd learn nothing, right? So you got it. You got to get expand that brain and look outside your area. And yeah, you'll you'll learn some learn some cool stuff, and it'll change how you farm. Yeah, the power of curiosity, my friend. The power of curiosity. Yes. Hey, you got Pete, it, Pete. I really uh, appreciate it. this. Has been awesome. Great fun discussion. Uh, awesome, dude. Yeah, I really appreciate it, Sean. Have yourself a great day, and I hope you manage to beat your son at golf one day in the future. Well, we got a big game on Friday. Big game. Yeah. He, I'm sorry to tell you he's probably going to beat you, but uh, good luck anyway. They're getting close. They're getting close. Hey, uh, <laughs> tomorrow on Real Ag Live, we're actually going to have Mary Robinson, president of the Canadian Federation of Agriculture. That's going to be a lot of fun. So today we did agronomy. Tomorrow we're going to do some ag policy, talk about trade and some of the things that are happening domestically. Of course, we've got the implementation of the USMCA about to happen here on July 1st. We've got the U.S. threatening more tariffs on steel and aluminum. we got a lot of stuff to ch chat about with 
Mary. Uh, we're broadcasting Real Ag Live every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, 3 p.m. Eastern, 1 o'clock Mountain. And I really appreciate everybody tuning in and having fun with Pete and I. Thank you very much, everybody, for getting real and getting connected with Real Ag Live. And don't forget about Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio 147 coming up here at 4.30 Eastern. Cheers, everybody.